So, let's get on to the good stuff. That's all the pathology behind the way, and I thought, you know, you need to know that. So, now get on to the work that I do. So, I would train myself in that um, to give you a good idea of my work that I do. Shoemaker's research has showed the diagnosis is based on assessment of the home. This is where I come in. ERMI, Environmental Relative Mould Index, was developed by the US EPA. And what it is is a collection of dust sample, just taking a dust sample and checking for over 200 microorganisms within the dust. It is one of the most effective ways to determine mould, fungi and bacteria. Because, because we know it's not one fungi that's causing the illness, we know it's a chemical stew of bacteria, fungi and all their byproducts. So ERMI gives us a mechanism to test the DNA. It's using poly, polymerase chain reaction uh, DNA sampling. And basically it's DNA sampling everything in that dust. And then because they've checked over 2,000 homes in the States that are healthy, they they can then use it as a sliding scale to go, this is a healthy home versus a sick home. The down marker on this is that it's expensive, it's $300 per sample, and you need to do two for a house. You need to do the bedroom and the living room. The other downside is that as a building biologist, seeing if mould is a problem is that I need to identify first, is mould an issue with this home? And secondly, where's the water coming from? And I have to use a variety of tools to assess that. Thermal imaging cameras, ATP testers, moisture meters, hygrometers, indoor air quality units, because it could be due to humidity levels or condensation. It could be due to just a flood. Um, and so there, it gets quite complicated what we need to do. And I'll give you a bit of an exp explanation explanation on that. Excluding all pathology tests. Most of you know, people with chronic fatigue, nothing comes up on the pathology test. Full blood examination, nothing. It's because we're not looking for the inflammatory markers and that's where it's sort of bypassed us for so long. Visual contrast sensitivity test. Gee, am I excited about this test. Used and developed uh, by the US military. It is a brilliant test to check for um, damage to the neurocentral uh, nervous system as a result of multiple chemicals i.e. chemical sensitivity, and due to biotoxins. And in fact, is used by the Center for Disease Control in the US to check for biotoxin damage. It's free. It takes five minutes on the internet to do. And the results I'm getting from this test are remarkable. So before I go to a patient's home who's sick with chronic fatigue, I get them to do the test to see if biotoxins are an issue. Now, this checks for biotoxin damage due to the inflammation based on what I've just talked about. It doesn't look at biotoxin illnesses due to an IgE-mediated response, which you'll pick up on a RAS test. Okay? So I'll summarise. Fungi can affect people in different ways. It can affect them through an IgE-mediated uh, response. But it can also affect them from a chronic inflammatory response, which is what I've focused on in this lecture. Visual contrast sensitivity looks at the way in which grey lines go to the side, where they go to this side, up and down this side. And it doesn't re revol um, involve your how good you are at seeing things. So wearing your glasses, if you wear it at a certain distance from the computer, you then determine and click, is the lines going to the left, to the right, upside down, etc. And you click the button. And that's it, pretty much. You go a whole lot of tests to check for visual contrast. And they've found that a damaged biotoxins and chemicals affect the optic nerve as a reflection of the damage in the central nervous system. So they're finding this a very useful test. It's not a test to use to diagnose patients, but it's another biomarker we can use to determine if biotoxins are affecting patients' illnesses. The biomarkers that Shoemaker primarily uses are low VIP, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, melanocyte stimulating hormone, antidiuretic hormone and VEGF, and high levels of TGF beta 1 and C4A. VCS has been used since the 1980s to determine the impact of chemicals on neurological function. So here is an example here, as you can see, of the test um, of different people. I'll go into an example. In fact, I've got a results of a patient of mine who has gone through this whole procedure, and I'll show you. I'll use her as a case study, unless I run out of time, which is very likely. 
VCS test provides a quick, non-invasive and inexpensive, inexpensive tool for assisting in the diagnosis of biotoxin and chemical related illnesses. In the scientific literature, VCS has been used for people with multiple chemical sensitivity. It's free. It takes you five minutes. It's brilliant. As a, one of the biomarkers to determine M MCS and also um, biotoxin and mold related illness. Deficits in VCS associated with chronic organic solvent exposure have been documented in the scientific literature. As you can see, there's a, um, one of the um, references. And biotoxin-induced neurological defects. A peer review on the state of the science concerning fisteria, which is a dinoflagellate that causes biotoxin illness. This is the one that Schumacher first got involved with because of the, the algae growing in the estuaries along the eastern seaboard of North America. The US Center for Disease Control concluded that VCS can be used to indicate neurological changes in patients exposed to fisteria, which is a biotoxin. Visual contrast sensitivity is used in conditions that affect your ability to discern. Um, this, uh, so these are the biomarkers that Schumacher is using for people with this inflammation. Low VIP, low MSH, high TGF, etc. High nasopharyngeal swab to check for Marcon's, which I mentioned. This is the reason why many of his patients didn't get better, because there are staph bacteria sitting there creating toxins that are setting up this inflammatory cascade of events in the central nervous system. Genetic testing, unfortunately it's still really expensive, um, but for whatever reason he's been able to, to test because they get insurance. They can claim it off their insurance in the States for genetic testing. I don't know what it's like here, but because of all the tests he's done on his 12,000 patients, he's identified this um, gene on chromosome 6 which makes these people susceptible to this systemic inflammation. Ironically, the same gene is used to identify possible organ rejection after a transplant. Another method of biomarkers that he uses is magnetic resonance imaging to determine specific brain structure volumes, gliotic areas, atrophy of the caudate nucleus and enlargement of the pallidum, pallidum left amygdala and right forebrain. Magnetic resonance spectroscopy is also a biomarker that he's using because of increased levels of lactic acid. The lactic acids, of course, is occurring because the inflammatory, the cytokines that are occurring in the capillaries are restricting oxygen and building up lactic acid within the brain and in the periphery. So he's finding that there's a change in the glutamate-glutamine ratio within the central nervous system. So that's the end of the pathology side of things. I want to go into mould remediation. So what do you do when there's mould in the house? Well, I have to say, this is probably one of the most <coughs> under, um, one of the most common causes of illnesses that is not being recognised by natural therapists, doctors, or even by the government. Mould has been with us since the planet was born. It, it is the most remarkable uh, species to be able to adapt to any environment. So if you give it food and water, it's going to survive because it's everywhere. So water is the key. And part of an important questionnaire for you to ask is, you know, how long have you been living in the house? Um, how long have you had the symptoms? Has there been any signs of flooding or water coming into the building? You know, are there drainage issues around the house, etc.? Are you in a flood zone? You know, all of these things are important. Why councils allow people to build in flood zones like Brisbane completely defies me. First, identify the moisture. If you don't get to the source of moisture, then the client's going to continually be sick. And all of the research from the US on this has found that giving cholestyramine and going through all of the um, nutritional supplements and getting rid of the Marcons is useless if you don't get to the mould. If they continue to live in a water damaged building, nothing will change. Containment. This is how they contain. Now, you can see here, this is a really bad mould infested house. I have to say, the worst mould homes I've ever seen, I couldn't smell mould and I couldn't see it. And I walked in there without my full face respirator, took the case history, and this is the typically how it goes. I'm really sick. I don't know what's going on. I've got chronic fatigue. I've been to every practitioner under the sun. I'm now going to the States to get treatment because no one can help me in Australia, but my husband's fine. He goes, I don't know what's wrong with her. He's also, he's almost implying, I think she's got a mental illness because there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. Interesting thing. I'll go through this case study because that's exactly what happened. 
how do we address mould? We contain it. Wherever the moisture is, we contain it. We then use negative air pressure so it doesn't continue to contaminate the rest of the house. We remove the contaminated materials, we clean the surfaces, and then we do post sampling. Apart from high humidity, in tropical climate zones, the majority of water problems in a house are due to condensation. Why? Because the ventilation is inadequate in our laundries and in our bathrooms. Who on earth would allow condensation to get in the roof cavity? Once it hits the dew point, it condenses, and then all the microbes sitting there in the bats, etc., and on the roof are starting to have a field day. We need to make sure the humidity from our showers is vented to the exterior so it doesn't create this condensation issue, which is a real problem. So I ask my patients, do you get condensation forming on your mirrors uh, or walls when you have a bath or when you have a shower? Because that should not happen. The ventilation is not adequate. And the more we've sealed our homes, the more of a problem this has. So I give lectures to Archi Centre and to the Building Design Association and they're horrified when I talk because I'm talking about how green does not equal healthy. In fact, green can actually make patients a hell of a lot worse. Why? Because you seal the building, you bring in Chinese mattresses that are loaded with formaldehyde and they take forever <coughs> to outgas because, you know, no one in Nick Nass isn't assessing and regulating the chemicals in those products. But that's another lecture altogether. <laughs> <laughs> food, water and spores equal mould growth. Where's the food? Everywhere. Where are the spores? Everywhere. So water is the key to mould related problems. Plumbing, gutter issues, roof issues, inadequate ventilation in wet areas, uh, inadequate uh, absence of waterproofing, amount of dodgy builders that don't waterproof the shower recesses adequately, inadequate drainage around the building. Why would you build a, hill, a house at the bottom of a hill? Think about the topography, you know, really have to think about if you've got patients with illnesses and, you know, a lot of the clients I deal with with kids with allergies, I'll go in and inspect before they buy the house and I go, this is not appropriate for your child with asthma. These are all the water damage issues that can occur in this particular house, let alone being near a lake that could have, you know, algae issues down the track. Land topography, flood zone, natural aquifers under the house, housekeeping issues, sometimes it's the occupants. You've got too many people, you know, I've gone into homes in Williamstown where you've got an entire Indian family and all their set two generations in one bedroom apartment and they're breathing out a hell of a lot of water vapour that's causing condensation issues. This can be a real problem. Uh, how we dry our clothes, where does the humidity go? You know, you've got to be careful about drying your clothes and your dryer, etc. It needs to be vented to the exterior. Aftermath of a fire, natural storms. This is an important one because what you see here is that the relative humidity levels, at 50% relative humidity, most, as most microbes cannot survive very well. So if you have asthma or allergies, keeping 50% humidity in the built environment at the home can significantly reduce their exposure to microorganisms because anything above 50% humidity enables bacteria, viruses, fungi and house dust mites to thrive. So this is why, you know, in high tropical uh, climate zones as we go further north, it's important to have dehumidifiers or air refrigerative air conditioners to dehumidify down to 50%. Get them to get a hygrometer, they're cheap from Radio Shack, um, in their house and try and keep 50% humidity and you'll find that the asthma levels and asthma attacks are significantly decreased because of this. One square inch of visible mould is likely to contain in excess of 500 billion spores. So if you can see it, it's already a problem. The problem with mould, how do you clean it? You don't. Because mould, whether it's viable or not viable, it contains mycotoxins. So all this thing about bleach, bleach is the worst thing you can do for mould because you give it a food source. You strip the melon out of it, so you bleach the mould, but within two weeks it comes back because it never went and now you've given it a food source. You don't need biocides. In fact, you'll find that uh, the IICRC, who are the major, um, uh, most reputable organisation of mould remediation in the world, they're based in the States, I just came back from the States doing my IICRC, and um, they state, don't use biocides on mould, don't use any chemicals on mould, because it's dead anyway. Killing the mould is irrelevant, because whether it's dead or alive, it still contains mycotoxins and other toxins that can make you sick. So contain a negative air, this is what a mould remediator do, will contain the air that's affected by mould. There's three ways. 
They then bring in dehumidifiers because they're going to get air scrubbers and air movers to get the moisture out of the building materials. The moisture gets into the air and then the dehumidifier will exhaust that into the exterior. If you don't do dehumidifiers, what's going to happen is these air scrubbers are going to get the moisture out of the wood and then the moisture goes into the air and then starts penetrating into the gyp rock and into the ceiling. So you have to have dehums, dehumidifiers, to get rid of the moisture. Then you remove contaminated material. A lot of material can be salvaged, but a lot can't. If it's in gyp rock, it's a problem. We have different category 1, 2, 3 and class 1, 2, 3 as to whether we can remove it or not, depending on the extent of the water damage. Biocides are not recommended, as I mentioned, because uh, unless extensive sewage contamination has occurred. They are the major authorities on this. How do we get rid of mould? We physically remove it with microfiber cloths. Microfiber cloths are the most important way to remove it because when it comes to microorganisms, it's a numbers game. Reduce their numbers. We use HEPA vacuum cleaners. Now, I'm saying that you need to get a proper mould remediator who's, who's uh, certified through the ICRC to get mould out of the house. Because if you get a Mickey Mouse carpet cleaner coming to clean your patient's mould, you're going to spread it and cause secondary damage throughout the whole house. So there are links on my website to accredited mould remediators that will be useful. So these are the measurements I use, etc. But, you know, the best stuff is yet to come. Let's do the, quickly do the case study. I'm sorry, I'm really rushing for uh, time here, but we do have half an hour at the end to ask questions. 54-year-old female presents with chronic fatigue. She has a history of antibiotic use and spastic bowel and gut dysbiosis is bad. Tonsillitis, hay fever, headaches, candida. She's lived in a water damaged building since she, since she since her childhood home. Then in Chadston for 10 years, headaches and migraines, joint pains. She moved to Blackburn, um, ongoing plumbing and drainage issues, muscular aches and pains, fatigue, sleep disturbances, weight loss, diet problems. She worked at the Freemasons in an old section that was water damaged, just to top it off. In her 50s, she has ongoing chronic fatigue. She's seen everybody about it. She now goes to the States to get treatments. Amalgam removal, as we know, tends to exacerbate most patients with CFS because of mercury vapour exposure. Severe reaction, she's getting worse. I went to her house to have a look what's going on. No visible mould, no detectable damp or musty odour. All my moisture readings were normal. They were dry. Visual inspect inspection showed cracking in the exterior garden, red brick wall, and moisture readings in the brick wall were high because of the fact that the garden beds had been put onto the, the brick wall and the moisture from the soil was getting into that area. Visual inspection underneath indicates staining and mould on the bearers under the bathroom because of previous water damage. ATP readings, which is a really great way to test, is checks up the ATP in the mitochondria of the microorganisms. So it's a cheap way for us to check, to check for microbes in various parts of the house without having to do air samples, which are expensive. Hot water overflow pipe drips into the soil, water and into the subfloor and the downpipe is leaking into the subfloor as well. And as a result of this, the concrete slab was sinking into the um, soil because of the amount of water damage. Can't see it well, there's a lot of rusting here, a lot of a slow water drip that's occurred for decades in this area getting into the subfloor. Significant dust issue. When I removed the registers and looked into her, her uh, ducted heating, I went, oh my God. I don't say that in front of my clients, of course, but I'm going, you know, I mean, I think it's normal. You get your vacuum cleaner and you clean out your ducts, but obviously a lot of people don't. She's been there for, you know, 15 years, and this is where all the mould samples and mould contamination was occurring because the flexible duct in the subfloor had breaks in it, and, of course, once you get water in the subfloor, when you draw the heating, of course, it draws in through the flexible duct into the return air, and it floods the entire house with, air with uh, spores and high sample counts. Vinyl flooring. Vinyl is the worst for those who are coming to tomorrow's women's health lecture. I'm talking on endocrine disrupting chemicals, and vinyl would be the worst would be the worst building material we could bring into our house because of the phthalate exposure and the risk to breast cancer, early puberty, etc. Vinyl contains phthalates, which are known endocrine disrupting chemicals, and it's also a um, waterproof membrane. So it's a disaster for water issues because any water in the subfloor that's coming up. It's acting as a water break and therefore creating more issues in the subfloor. This, these were the results of this woman. It's 
house. Remember, he is not sick. She is so sick. She said, I know within hours of being in my house, I'm so sick, I can no longer live there. They're living in a rental house around the corner because she can no longer live in her house in Blackburn. And the mould counts were 32,200 uh, per metre cubed of air. Outside was 8,000. They were 32,000 in the master bedroom. And it was all coming from her, um, from the subfloor because the, there were breaks in the flexible duct allowing it to come in through the whole heating system and, and um, affecting the entire house, but particularly the master bedroom. She said, well, that's interesting because I always find the master bedroom I can't sleep in, so I've been sleeping in the living room for the last three months because I can't sleep in the bedroom because I get so sick. And it confirmed. He doesn't get sick. Why? He doesn't have this G this DNA that I was talking about, this genotype, which affects 24% of the population. So her tests were normal. We then did, I then got her to do all the tests that Shoemaker recommends. I've got the results of her test. Nutripath in the last two months have now are now doing these tests. So these tests have not been available in Australia that I'm aware of beforehand, but Nutripath now are doing these tests for all these inflammatory biomarkers um, in the last two months. We did this test after she was normal and in fact her visual contrast sensitivity within three months of moving out of her house, her visual contrast test went from really, went from positive to negative. So it was a really good marker to determine how, that she was getting better. She said, I feel better. The VCS test is now negative and um, when we did this test when she was much better because she's no longer living in her house for the last three months, um, these are the tests that she, you know, these are all her tests and we've just run out of time so um, immunoserology etc blood stool tests neutropath these are all the tests that she got she didn't come up as high in terms of inflammation because she was 90% better because she'd been out of her house for the last three months what she said that instigated her to pick up the phone and get me in to test her house was she said of all the things I've done, like I get intravenous glutathione, I've been to the States, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars in treatment. But the thing that helps most is when I don't live in my house. And that's why I needed you to come to check. I think it's in my head because my husband, Pete, who smokes like a chimney, doesn't get anything. Um, and lo and behold, when we looked at those air samples results, they were off the rack. We could no longer go in that house without a full face and Tyvek suit. That's how contaminated that house was. But you couldn't see this, the mould and you couldn't smell it. So are these diseases actually a chronic inflammatory response? Are we going to see in time that what we thought was chronic fatigue as a misdiagnosis is actually a chronic inflammatory response syndrome, where chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivity, mold illness, maybe even electromagnetic hypersensitivity, fibromyalgia, could these actually be inflammatory disorders that we have not been looking at in the right place for the biomarkers? So I'm a building biologist. I write the book Healthy Home, Healthy Family, which is on the Acton website. Thank you very much. Um, the book that I, and I'm also the CEO of the Australian College of Environmental Studies, so I train people to become building biologists, to walk into buildings and to see if the house is making their family sick. I run nationally accredited training. Uh, it's currently a Cert four, and I'm developing an advanced diploma in building biology because we just don't have enough people to do the work. And we get a lot of calls from people who are sick who at the last resort want to see if their house is making them sick. So this is what we do. We liaise with doctors and mould remediators, uh, electricians, plumbers, sparkies. We're talking to a lot of tradespeople about how to wire a house to reduce people's exposure to EMFs, how to, um, you know, create a drainage, more adequate drainage. We work with engineers, etc. We work with lots of different people, which makes my job very interesting. That's my book, um, which you probably have seen. And there are all the references. I did finish, and I think I've got a couple of minutes left. Or not? Fantastic, Nicole. Thank you very much. And a, and a huge amount of information you covered in a remarkably short time. And I'm sure our heads are spinning a little bit. Who would like to start the question? I'll start round. We'll go around the room. How about that? Thank you, Nicole. That was a fantastic presentation. I learned so much. I have a couple of questions. One, what is that NutriPath test panel called? Yes, I don't know, but it's the only one of its kind on their um, on their website. So I'll give okay. you that to have right. a look through. Yeah, thank you. And then, which HLA haplotype do you have to test for? DR. 
It's just called DR. Yeah, that there's I'm no, aware of. no number. Not that I'm aware of. There's, yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd need to look at Shoemaker's website, biotoxin.org. Mm -hmm. But if you Google Richie Shoemaker, there's actually an 11-step protocol for GPs. I believe Tanya Ash is... Tanya Ash and there's a doctor in Queensland are the only two GPs that are following this protocol um, at the moment. And he has an 11-step protocol specific for GPs that you can... That's not familiar. He has an Indian name. He's in Queensland. And he's been following a lot of this work as well. So Tanya is the one who I send my clients to at the moment. But I like to be able to send all my interstate clients to you guys <laughs> to be able to help them um, identify why they're sick. Yeah. And a quick third question. How, why do people get more susceptible to having electric shocks when they have more water in their body is it just it's the sodium levels because sodium. the decrease in ox uh, decrease in water it's the osmolality issues that they have so because of the decrease in the water they have higher levels of sodium and because of the increase in electrolytes they're more susceptible to the electric shocks okay. thank you right. moving around Matthew Strack from Dunedin, New Zealand. Uh, thank you for a very interesting and, and passionate talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. You uh, talk about HLA and uh, the haplotypes we test for for people with gluten sensitivity are 2.2, 2.5 and 8. And you're talking about 6 for people with uh, this type of sensitivity. It doesn't seem that they're overlapping. I couldn't comment on that. Yeah, okay. You'd need to look at Shoemaker's um, research in terms of into that because I don't do the pathology testing. No. Mm -hmm. Because I just, just think that that was a fascinating concept you brought up. Yeah. Uh, second thing, at one point you said something about systemic inflammation affected probiotics. Uh, could you explain that a little more? Yeah, it was more in terms of the way in which the microorganisms which continue to survive in clients who have this genotype, that it can actually affect when they're actually swallowing the sputum in children, for example, or when it's getting into the intestines through the bile, that the bacteria on their process of the way of getting excreted could actually ex be exposing and affecting the um, uh, dysbiosis within the gut, so affecting the probiotics that are naturally within the gut. Okay. Yeah. And just finally a comment. I grew up next to a river, so I'm rethinking parts of my otherwise very happy childhood. <laughs> this table. G'day, I'm a GP in a subtropical town that turns black in summer. So, uh, rural town, what's, what's an assessment cost? Um, where, how do people in rural areas get somebody to assess? Or alternatively, how does what does it cost to actually do a cert for so that local people can be trained? Yes, good questions. Um, we have 15 building biologists currently, 20 building biologists are currently graduated. At least half of them did it out of interest because they have kids on the spectrum or have allergies or chemical sensitivity and live in remote areas because they're quite sick. So we have very few around us. Australia. We have approximately five working in um, Melbourne and two in Sydney at the moment, but in remote areas we don't have many people to do it, unfortunately. The Cert 4 consists of eight subjects. It's a one-year full-time course and it is currently $6,500 to do and you pay as you go per subject. It is study accredited, but it depends if you're eligible for study through Centrelink. Yep. As I said, I'm currently de uh, developing the advanced diploma, which will be an extra year to that, and I'll focus more on children's environmental health and EDCs particularly. Um, and also on mould testing. So a lot of the work that I'm doing, because there's no methodology to do mould testing, and that was part of the reason I went to the States recently, mm. is I'm developing a methodology to be able to make sure that all my graduates are um, consistent in their ability to identify moisture intrusion in a building, because at the moment it's a dog's breakfast. I speak a lot at the mould remediation conferences, and they don't connect the illness with the mould. They just see there's a flood, we just need to clean it, etc., and don't have an understanding of the illness illnesses that can occur in, in the, their patient or in their client's homes. So I'm trying to map and get you connected with the mould remediators, accredited mould remediators, who can do the work and actually remediate. 
But building biologists are the ones who test. So often we'll go in and they'll say, look, I've got chronic fatigue. I think my house is making me sick because it's happened since I've been here. We have to exclude electromagnetic fields. We have to exclude mould. They are the two big triggers first. And when it comes to insomnia, um, they are also, EMFs are the big trigger for a lot of those symptoms. So the symptoms, I train my building biologists to go, these are the symptoms and these are the hazards likely to affect these symptoms and you need to exclude those. Sometimes, rarely, in 5% of times when I'm doing an audit, I'll find um, the house isn't making them sick. And I'll say, look, you need to go and see an integrated GP or, or naturopath because it's not related to your house. And that's nice to do that. Mind you, they've just spent $400 for my advice. But, you know, it's, it's rare. It's rare. But we need to get more people to work building biologists with you guys. But there's so few people doing the work. So $400 for an assessment? I charge $400 for an assessment, yep. Yeah. It takes about three hours. That's actually less than what's going to do, so. yeah. yeah. That doesn't include mould samples. To do mould samples, they're $75 per plate with the lab. Yeah. So it can, it, it can get to $1,000 for mould sampling because it's simply the lab costs. You have to do one outside as a benchmark for what's happening inside because that's what you're comparing it to. And that's was one year? One year full-time, two years part-time. Uh, distance. distance you have to come to Melbourne to do a seven day intensive so we need to show you what to do <coughs> uh, Tim I did ask before where do you get the spartane free oh. cholesteramine it costs a thousand dollars to a month to um, compound it here I believe yeah I think I'm afraid it's, it, you do need a compound really it's a problem um, I can talk to you about it later and what do you think about earthing mats for EMF? Or Ooh, I'm going to talk about EMFs at the, towards the end of today, so can we talk about that then? Um, uh, very interesting uh, lecture, Nicole, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I'm a, an environment, uh, en environmental um, uh, health uh, researcher and my investigations, uh, my studies into this area clearly points to a chronic inflammatory response to be um, behind a lot of the uh, chronic um, immune, neurological or endocrine uh, disorders we are we are seeing on the rise um, uh, at present, but uh, in terms of you know, uh, of course the the mold issue is is a, is an issue in in a lot of homes, uh, in uh, affected um, individuals. However, when I look at the the scientific literature into uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity or, um, and and um, uh, and what you have presented, it is a real uh, chicken and egg uh, situation. You know what is uh, down? I think uh, this sensitivity to um, fungal toxins um, is a downstream pro process. Um, the, the, my, my findings point to electromagnetic radiation as a trigger, like a trigger of stress, a chronic stress response. Oh, sorry, stress responses in in the in the body, and as a result, individuals may become more sensitive to um, a range of um, like ordinary you know proteins. You know, it could be. Um, you know, um, um, you know, all sorts of you know allergies and uh, like more autoimmune processes. So it's a challenge, but you are on the right path. You know, it's obviously the infl inflammatory um, cascade is very important to study, and and um, you know determining which fits where is 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 the challenge. And that's a difficult one to answer because, you know, with EMFs we're all exposed, most of us have mobile phones, we know electromagnetic fields increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. So if you have a patient with mould using a mobile phone, increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, all these biotoxins are getting in quicker. I think what we all acknowledge is that chronic illnesses involve multiple causes. They are not a one-stop, you know, what this causes this, etc. We need to look at the entire patient's history, their diet, their lifestyle, etc. And EMFs is certainly an issue that we're all exposed to whether we want to or not because the amount of, you know, cell towers, Adelaide has just become white, what, using wire land across its entire capital city. It's just, we can't get away from it, which really represents an interesting thing for the science, a dilemma for the scientific community because how do you have a control group? You know, but let me leave that one to uh, this afternoon when I talk about EMFs. 
Uh, hi, uh, I'm Lindy Poole. I'm a GP from the Adelaide Hills, kind of mould central, I think. Uh, it's pretty damp up there at the moment. But I was wondering, I've got a couple of patients, you mentioned dizziness, and uh, I've got a couple of patients with many uh, type things, not totally diagnosed. And um, is the basis for that the whole um, osmolality thing, um, the sodium um, concentration, do you think? It's, it's they suspect that it could be due to the impact on melanocyte stimulating hormone as the neuropeptide. What I have found though is a lot of clients who are exposed to high levels of radio frequencies have many ears and vertigo who respond by getting out of that situation. So I, that's only from my own clinical um, observations that they've developed it. Like I had a husband and wife who moved into a house in Northcote in Melbourne and uh, within six months she developed many ears and three months later her husband did, which is really odd. When I went to do the audit, their bedroom, which is windows on three sides, and windows are important important in terms of radio frequencies because it can get through windows, it, you know, just travels through radio waves. I could see five mobile phone towers from their ma from their master bedroom, and I could measure them. The levels were excessive, and they found, you know, I think it's an interesting coincidence that a couple developed many years within three months of each other moving into this house and uh, have se since moved away and because hers was quite severe she was on medication for that as well he's stopped moving out of the house but she's continuing needing medication but yeah the house seems to have been contributing on some level there's limited evidence on its relationship to many years but I think it's one we need to look out for and exclude. So the mould issue is not such a big one? For dizziness yes yes it can mould is another one that can cause the dizziness as well definitely so ask the patient about water intrusion in the house flooding drainage all that sort of stuff important and the thing is you don't have to see it for it not to be a problem the worst homes I've been in I couldn't see it or smell it and you literally would not be able to walk back in there without a Tyvek suit and a full face yeah well thank you very much indeed uh, Nicole there are so many questions one can raise about some of the presentation and the information, but um, <clears throat> I'd like to draw attention to the diagram here, and down the left-hand corner, it says that uh, the pit pituitary gland can give rise to elevated levels of cortisol and ACTH. Cortisol is produced in the adrenal glands. Not in the pituitary. No, yeah, that's right. So, so that ACT. needs to be uh, made clear. Sure. Um, we all know from influenza infections that uh, when the infection goes into the lower parenchyma of the lungs, mm. that is followed by about six weeks of immune suppression. So DTH reactions become negative, and. Uh, you get activation of things like herpes simplex and so on. So that's a very important aspect to this. But once the lower parenchyma is invaded by organisms, you can then experience um, suppression, or if you like, energy, for up to six weeks. I'm told to keep this short, so... <clears throat> I'm concerned about the compliment cascade. I know a lot about compliment and the emphasis upon C4. Compliment can be activated by the alternative pathway or by the classical pathway. And what happens to the rest of the cascade? There are anaphylatoxins there. C5A can activate certain cells and cause degranulation. So what's, happen what's happening there? That's your question? Yes. In terms of the rest of the complement. Yes. In the research, in the scientific literature that Schumacher has done, he has found that C4A is the most important marker, that C, uh, C4, uh, B, etc., that the other complement has not been involved. Now, as I said, I'm not a GP and I don't do pathology tests, but I think what is a useful thing is for us to start looking at these inflammatory markers as a potential understanding as this as an inflammatory disorder. So I, I'd suggest that you look at his website in relation because he goes into detail. And in fact, even in the book, which I don't think I've mentioned, Surviving Mold is an actually an excellent book, um, which goes into the pathology behind the inf systemic inflammation that occurs. Um, and there'll be a lot more detail there. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think it's time to thank Nicole once again for a fabulous talk.